Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Gérard Bertolon from Cuisine Solution, and I have AJ from uh, Scheller from Crea. Um, a little history about uh, our company. Uh, Cuisine Solution, we, uh, we started sous -vide in 1971. So most of us know us about uh, sous -vide. Um, And with Crea, uh, with our education arm, we have uh, trained more than 48 three stars chefs around the world. Uh, some of us saw us in a book from Thomas Keller, Under Pressure, page 13 to 16. There is three pages on us. Uh, before us, Thomas Keller never did any sous vide. So we have a long relationship with uh, Thomas and his team and many other chefs. Uh, we started in America Cuisine Solution 30 years ago and we produce sous vide and we cook sous vide. We have plants in uh, France, in America, in Thailand. And, uh, we have uh, the school with CREA, we have a school in Paris and a school in, uh, in uh, Washington DC, but uh, we train on uh, sous vide and some other technology around the world. So I'm going to let you uh, start. Hello, good afternoon everybody. Uh, as Gerard mentioned, we are from Cuisine Solutions in CREA and I'm the chef at CREA in Washington DC. And we're very excited to introduce a technique to you today called extraction and cryoconcentration. And the way that you could consider that is where sous vide was about 30 or 40 years ago. And we've trained some top chefs around the world, and we've got a great tasting for you guys as well. And thank you to the culinary students that are helping us plate everything. And basically, that's us. <laughs> So Gerard talked a little bit about Cuisine Solutions, and you could probably say that you've tried our products and might not even known it, and I'll let Gerard explain a little bit more about that. Well, our product can be found in uh, many uh, hotel chains, first class, if you get upgraded. Um, and the uh, hotel, and uh, we are at Whole Food, we are at uh, Wegmans. I mean, we are really in a, a you, you don't know about our product, because what we want to do, we want to be the line cooks. We want to keep the product as simple as possible, salt and pepper, and let the chef do Chinese, Italian, French. We, are, uh, we want to make sure the product is cooked at the right temperature. Many chefs are cooking sous vide themselves, but uh, you can see on the internet, they go way too low. And you should never, never go under 52 Celsius, because starting 52 Celsius, you start destroying bacteria. Under 52 Celsius, you grow bacteria. So sometimes you see salmon at 40, 45 degrees. Uh, if you cook and serve, it's okay, but if you hold it, that can be very dangerous. So we sell products who are 100% uh, fully pasteurized and fully cooked. Thanks, Jared. So Crea is a sister to Cuisine Solutions, and we work hand in hand to not only provide products for food service establishments, but train the chefs as well. And it's really important to us to share our knowledge about sous vide because it's important to us to know that people are doing things properly and safely, and CREA helps to uh, facilitate that. We travel around the world. Uh, our chief scientist, Bruno Gousseau, is on a plane at least every couple weeks to, to train everybody, Europe, Asia, America, South America, you name it. Um, just came from a training in Sea Island, Georgia. We have another one coming up at the end of this month in our facilities in Sterling, Virginia, really close to Washington, D.C. and Dulles. And we also do consulting, so we've got a multidiscipline staff of scientists and chefs and engineers, and we do everything from kitchen design to menu development, but our core uh, purpose is to share our knowledge with chefs all around the world, and we want to um, spread the word about sous vide, and now we're spreading the word about extraction and cryoconcentration. <laughs> so, if you haven't met him already, this is Dr. Bruno Gusso. He's our leader, our chief scientist of Cuisine Solutions in Crea, and he's pioneered the technique of sous vide. Um, I met Bruno when I took the training with him when I worked for Daniel Baloud, and he Only continues to do years. so. Only for 11 years. And he really, you know, not just in manufacturing, but he's a, he's a friend of top chefs, and Crea is a friend of top chefs. You know, we're on speed dial if there's quick questions, we do trainings, um, we'll, we'll come to you, and it's, 
become a, a revolution in the kitchen. Sous vide really started in the manufacturing side. It trickled its way down to top chefs in restaurants. And now it's really popular at home today. I mean, who here has a circulator in their house? All right. Right? <laughs> so what we like to do is to kind of preach the, the most precise quality and safe way to cook sous vide. And also, we're aware that right now there's a lot of uh, concern about food waste in the world. Um, I know that there are different ways to utilize trimmings and peelings and things like that in stocks. Of course, as a chef, you want to preserve things through conservation, pickling, curing, having all of those flavors all year round. But sous vide is the perfect vessel for preserving flavors. We really fix flavors with that process. And Bruno's been training the chefs on that. And that's the first step of the process that we call extraction. One more thing about Bruno, last year uh, the Albert Einstein Foundation selected the 100 living geniuses in the world for the anniversary of the relativity, can you say that? Theory of relativity. Yes, hard for a French guy to say that. <laughs> and it was only one person selected for food. They had the seven Nobel Prize, some astronaut, and Bruno was uh, selected for the food. The Albert Einstein Foundation recognized that sous vide it's going to be a big part of the future to have uh, great food, but safe food. And uh, because we're going to need a lot of food when somebody says we're going to be like 7 billion people very soon. And uh, we cannot afford to waste any food. So extraction is the method of taking trimmings or pieces of vegetables, fruits, meat bones, any of that stuff that you might want to uh, take flavor from into a broth or a liquid, but in the sous vide technique. So we're going at a lower temperature for a long time, and we're taking the resulting liquid, and with that, we start cryoconcentration. And it's been a process where we're training top chefs, but we're working towards being able to manufacture. Um, there are other places in the world that do things called fractional freezing or freeze distillation, perhaps. But our process is completely natural. We're not putting any additives inside. It's really not necessary. And when you start cryoconcentration after the sous vide technique, you're starting with the best uh, level of the flavor because we're not going above uh, uh, temperature where we're hydrolyzing the pectin. So it stays nice and clear and you've got uh, all of the aromas staying inside of the pouch. There's no vapor coming out. All of the volatile aromas that come out when you're making a braise, for example, at home. I mean, when you make a braise at home, it smells really good, right? With sous vide, everything is staying inside of the pouch. So that's why we start with sous vide extraction. And then we start the freeze concentration. And we've got a bit of a video that we'd like to share with you from the last training that we did with uh, Chef you Thomas Keller. Sure but before that, I'd like to explain the tasting. So what you're going to get is a small plate uh, that we've labeled for you. And you've got small pipettes that you can just like pick up the bulb and squeeze it in your mouth. Um, on the far left, it's extract. So that's the first part of the process where we cook sous vide and we reserve the liquid. That's it. The second is the second cryoconcentration, and the cryoconcentration is removing water, but in the form of ice crystals. And then finally, the third concentration, and you can see the bricks is increasing all the way to 24, which is high enough. You could take this and do a lot of things with it, add it as flavoring to your sauces, soups, stocks, uh, garmage items, ceviche, cocktails, any of that. You could even take this and put it in a canister and spin it on the Paco Jet, and you've got a completely uh, naturally sweet sorbet. So if you just want to try them in succession, start from the left and work your way over. And then you'll also see a shot glass. And in there we have a sous vide vegetable broth with some produce that I picked up from the market a couple days ago at the San Diego Specialty Produce. It was pretty delicious. So that of course was also cooked sous vide. And we have the broth, but you'll see another pipette that is a darker color, and that actually is the sixth cryoconcentration of mushroom stems. So the carrot is carrot peelings and trim. Could have been discarded. The mushroom is mushroom stem from a button, you know, Paris mushroom. You know, not a lot of flavor in that. But when you start the cryoconcentration process, this is actually the sixth concentration. And it's so intense, it's like soy sauce, very umami, little truffle-y type flavors, almost like porcini in a way. 
and there's almost no water left inside. If we tried to freeze that liquid, it would be really difficult because the water is coming out, but in the form of ice rather than thermal treatment. And if you want to taste it on its own or add it into the broth as a little punch to uh, the, the soup, that, that's great. So you should try the broth first, and then uh, you can squeeze your, uh, taste the mushroom and then squeeze the mushroom, and you're going to see how, how much you can bring flavors and more umami in your broth. And nothing has been added to the pipettes. It's just the flavor of the natural ingredient. So we'll show you a video from the training that we did with Chef Keller's team. We've had uh, Danielle's team, my old boss, come in uh, for a training as well. Uh, we've worked with a lot of Robichon chefs. And Yannick Aleno, as Gerard mentioned, is using this in Paris in his restaurant. And our chief scientist, Bruno, showed him this technique. And it helped contribute to get his three Michelin stars. So we're very proud of that. If you want to launch the video, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So you let us know. We'll continue. Yeah. Move to the next one. Oh. So really, you look at your uh, trash every day, and you'll find tons of things. And most of the time, uh, you think, well, I can really cannot do anything with it. Like leave of artichoke. Usually they're bitter. They're. Oh, it's coming. So let's go. This is our lab in Virginia. We have another location in Paris. Here you can see some artichoke leaves. Those have a ton of flavor. I don't know who likes to turn artichokes. Anyone? Safe leaves, cryoconcentrate. We did a comparison side by side of boiled reduction, rotary evaporator, and cryoconcentration. And part of the discovery that you can see is that the flavor is much more pure. This is an exercise where we did a build your own chicken stock. So all of the different ingredients cryoconcentrated separately and then recombined to the chef's tastes. So I was saying you'd be surprised with uh, where we can cryoconcentrate. You know, like I said, uh, you can take the liver of the artichoke and uh, usually you cannot really do anything and you'll get a flavor with no bitterness and really, uh, really, really strong flavors. Um, we've been doing, I don't know, maybe 80 or 90 different uh, uh, items. Uh, uh, AJ was talking about Yannick Aleno. Yannick Aleno, for people who don't know him, he has two three-star Michelin, and we've been working with him and his team for the last three years, and he has uh, about 80% of his sauce who are made like that. He has two cooks in his kitchen who are doing only cryoconcentration every day, um, and they do about 30 different, uh, uh, different juice, different uh, vegetables. Um, then when you cryoconcentrate, you can push it uh, farther, and you can do it like a cabernet, like a sommelier will mix it up. So you'll do 5% of celery, 8% of mushroom, and you can create really well-balanced uh, vegetable juice or consommé. Usually you need a little fat, so a couple drop of fat of uh, tarragon oil or whatever, a few herbs, and you can have a, a, a juice uh, with so much flavor without a, any, any fat, any butter, sorry for the butter company. Uh, very healthy, and instead of having a sauce, will be 130 to 200 calories, it might be only like uh, 20 to 30 calories. So by doing that also, we're able to uh, you know, work with, uh, with uh, mixologists. And you know, sometimes they, you, know, you don't want to wash down um, uh, the alcohol. So instead of just putting a carrot juice or something savory where you're going to bring down the, the flavor because there is so much water in a, any kind of juice, you can cryoconcentrate and just bring a few drops of the carrot juice or celery or whatever you're going to make it and get really, really outstanding cocktails. 
We like to say that cryoconcentration really has natural origins. It happens in nature with maple syrup, for example. So the sap that comes from hardwood trees, when the wood cells are freezing the water inside, it's pushing out the concentrated liquid. Because water is freezing at a higher temperature than the liquid that has the soluble sugars, minerals, anything that contributes to flavor inside of it. So that's just an example of, of you know, the idea of separating the water in the form of ice rather than thermal treatment. And then with maple, it separates out with some pressure when it is thawing. Also, desalinization of seawater is an example of cryo. If you're able to freeze the pure water, the salt is pushed out, and then you save your pure water from the ice, you let that thaw, and that's your, your water from the desalinization pro process. So basically, those ideas uh, are a good explanation of cryoconcentration. So it's really the most important to find the eutectic point of the liquid that you're working with. And that's the point in which the water is freezing, but the rest of the flavorful liquid is behind. So anything with salt, uh, you know, it's better done with uh, items that are pretty liquid because when you have a lot of gelatin or pectin, um, it might stay behind with the ice. Sometimes fat in the example of milk, but I'll get into that a little bit later. But basically we're removing water without thermal treatment. So if, who, who likes to drink slushies, anybody? Like, no, yeah, okay. So what happens when you have your cup of slushy from 7-Eleven or wherever? Um, leave it in your cup holder or on the counter. It starts to separate, right? So all of the syrup sinks to the bottom. You get a jolt of sugar if you try to drink it. And all the ice is sitting on top. So really simply put, that's the process of cryoconcentration. But every ingredient is a little bit different. Um, we can do the process through the force of centrifugal force. We can let it strain. Um, different products like to be treated differently. There's two different schools of thoughts whether or not you want to have large ice crystals or small ice crystals. And we explore all of that in the course. And it's really important also to uh, check the remaining frozen ice that's left over after each uh, cycle to make sure you don't have any bricks left in the ice. So every single thing that we test out we're checking the bricks of the liquid, the flavorful liquid, as well as the ice. And we know it's kind of time to stop if you start to get a higher bricks in the ice, or it starts to taste like something, or you can't freeze it anymore. It's like having a distilled liquor. You know, it's, you throw it in the freezer and it's good to go. So that mushroom, I don't know if you've tried, some of you have tried it already. If I kept going with that, it would be more and more salty. We're not adding anything to it, we're just removing water. So it's up to your taste how far you want to take it but you can really discover some amazing, amazing flavors with this technique. We also experiment with, uh, is anybody familiar with aquafaba? Yes, so if you have a product that is cooked um, sous vide as compared to the canning process, it's a little bit more natural flavor. Uh, we do chickpea liquid cryoconcentration, and it is a really nice, stable emulsion. Um, other legumes work as well, like uh, flageolet vert, haricot cocoa, even lentils. They all have different flavors, and you can use that uh, legume, put it in your recipes, save the liquid, cryoconcentrate, and use it, and it's a dietary substitution. You can replace uh, if it gets to a certain foaming property, an emulsifying property, you can replace eggs, you can replace dairy. The photo on the top right is cryoconcentration of milk. That's not whipped cream. That's basically skim milk that is not homogenized, so it's a little bit easier to separate, but it is pasteurized. And after the third cryoconcentration, the casein, the protein, it's like 80% of the protein in cow's milk, that's left in the milk, it's just increasing in volume because you're removing water only. Also, you've got lactase, which is very sweet in this process, and so you're getting a really nice, sweet, flavorful, farm fresh tasting whipped cream that also doesn't have fat inside because when we're freezing the ice, 
the fat is freezing at the same temperature and is part of the process that's coming out. And it ends up having like a really unctuous mouthfeel, like there is fat inside, but it's really just the increased protein that's making it foam and keeping it nice and light and airy and sweet. You can really keep it for one hour and you come back, it's exactly the same, it doesn't move. Uh, without any putting any powder or anything, it's all natural. This milk also, if you want to make ice cream with it, that's really nice. Uh, Low-fat ice cream, you can do creme anglaise. If I use the same creme anglaise recipe with the cryo-concentrated milk versus regular milk, it's just thick like pastry cream. It's totally different. You've got much higher level of protein inside. On the left there are some more different flavors. So at, at, the, crab, at the lab at Crea, we've done so many different products. So I think that might have been beet, uh, probably fruits, pears, apples, leeks, celery, cucumber, all of those things are really nice. And you can, of course, cryoconcentrate juice, juice, just fresh juice. But we try to focus on things that might be discarded, food waste. We don't want anything to you know, be going in the bin. And even the solids that are left over after the extraction process, we find ways to use it for uh, fertilizer and things like that. So I think one thing who surprised me the, the most as a chef is you know when you go to the uh, a re, uh, grocery stores, you see a big trash with all the leaves from the corn. So you take that and you cook it and it tastes exactly like corn. And it's amazing, it's just you know, zero food cost, and you get such a good flavor of corn. And we use also the core of it, so on the corn, you use 100%. Uh, the one thing also surprising as a chef is the peel of the carrots has more flavor than the carrot itself. Right. And to make sure you understand, I'll let AJ explain. Well, the carrot that you guys tried, did you guys try the carrot pipettes yet? What do you think of the third concentration? It's like candy to me, right? Like, but not, it doesn't taste super cooked or processed. It's not, you know, so cloying. It's got that minerally flavor. It's got all the natural flavors left from the carrot skin because the carrot's growing in the soil. That's where all of the minerals and, you know, are being absorbed and going into to feed the carrot. So we always like to use what might be discarded. And a lot of times those parts of the vegetable have the most flavor. Um, the idea also is to utilize the product when it's in season. So as a chef, uh, I have too much. I just had some really good citrus, by the way, <laughs> this week. The citrus here is amazing. But when you have a lot of harvest and you want to find ways to preserve it, what do you do? You cure it, you confit, you, you know, pickle, preserve, do all those type of things to respect it while it's in the peak of season. This is another thing that you can do. You could do extraction of the peelings, of the, the pith, of all of these things of the fruit that might give flavor. And it's a frozen process, so it's the same idea. You keep it all year round, you add it to your dishes as you see fit, and it's a really nice thing to do for adding extra flavor and making sure that you're utilizing every single bit of the produce. The photo on the bottom right is a Bloody Mary. Uh, we actually just did that. Gerardo and I were in Germany last week. <laughs> but it's something that you can do. This was made with uh, the peelings in the seeds of Roma tomatoes, extracted and cryo-concentrated. Some products have enough juice in them. You don't have to add water to it in the first part of the process, tomato being one of them. And then it was cryo-concentrated four times and also celery extract and cryo, as well as horseradish skin only, combined with a little vodka, because, you know, Bloody Mary, and a little celery stick with some spice on it. So it's a really fun technique for bartenders as well. We've done spins on Bloody Mary, pina colada, uh, daiquiris, things of that nature. And, you know, a little spherified cocktail. The bottom left is chocolate mousse made with cryo-concentrated uh, dried green bean liquid. And it's so good. Like just nice chocolate, touch of sugar, and the whipped uh, legume liquid, it, it just whips ex exactly like egg whites. And the one in the middle on the bottom is a dish that Ricardo Bertolino prepared in Maison Belude in Montreal. 
So he works for Danielle and took the course with us and has been introducing it on his menu as well, which isn't too surprising because he also used to work for Unique Eleno. So um, just a few examples, you know, pastry, garmage applications, cocktails, really nice. I have a friend who's a chocolate maker and he, he, he didn't follow the class yet, but he said that's going to open a whole new uh, line of chocolate because a lot of uh, fruit are too light in flavors, so he cannot use it because the chocolate overpowers it. And then you can find that in also in pastry. So by cryo-concentrated, now he's going to open a whole new panel of fruit that can, he can use in his chocolate. Uh, Gaia, the, you're going to see uh, the chef from Daniel Boulou. She was elected the best chef uh, at the James Beard Award last year. Um, she did a, a strawberry uh, dessert for, uh, for charity with Daniel. And all the chefs were coming to see her and said, can you give me your name of your supplier for strawberry? Because I never had so strawberry with so much flavors. And that's where she talked about, no, I cryoconcentrate my strawberry. Here, she didn't extract it. She just made the juice and cryoconcentrate it. Uh, we do that sometimes with uh, cucumber. We'll use uh, the seeds, the pulp. You, of course, you can do a salad with it. The skin, we do also a cryoconcentration. So we use 100% of it. Also, when we cook something, we destroy the enzymatic system. So after we remove the juice, you can uh, uh, put some bacteria and then start the enzymatic system, and then you can compost it. Last fall, we had a lot of apple <clears throat> trimming. We work with produce companies that are local, and we're like, give us your trimmings, give us your peelings. We want it. We want to sous vide it. We want to make uh, some nice uh, dishes out of it. And the apple skin and core that was cooked sous vide, the liquid that was yielded from it, we crowd concentrated it a few times and dosed it with some champagne yeast and made a cider, and it was good. So just imagine, like, usually you would do that with something that still has the enzymes inside and the sugars, and it's easily to, you know, easy to ferment, but you can boost it with a little yeast and get, get a nice uh, brew out of that. That's a few chefs who came to our training. Um, and we train many more uh, people, and I think that's the last one. And do you have any question? We love question. There is no stupid question. Yes. So we have to cook at uh, not high temperature, but we have to do it overnight. So to be able to extract as long. Um, working with Thomas was really interesting because he said, "Why are you cooking at a uh, low temperature? Uh, why not?" getting a high temperature, so we did it when it was there. And when you cook at a higher temperature, it tastes more like roasted vegetable. Instead, you saw our clean palate, the flavor was really nice and clean, like a nice wine. Then you raise it and you test the same vegetable, the same peel. We cook them at two temperature overnight, and it was tasting more like roasted vegetable. So I'm not saying one is better than th the other one, but depending what you want to do. If you're going to be in the fall and you're going to have some wild game and something, maybe you want to raise the temperature and get more uh, roasting flavors. We want to be below boiling temperature, obviously, because if you get it above 90 Celsius approximately, you've got the hydrolyzation of the pectin. And you'll notice the, the tasting that you had. It was pretty clear, almost clarified type of uh, liquid. If we went much higher than that, we'd start to overcook the solids, and then you've just got a puree. So we want to be able to decant the liquid after, like get it nice and tight in the sous vide pouch. So that's also very important. If it's not sous vide, it's not going to have the same flavor because you're having vapor escaping. And we did do experiments on that, like, oh, what if we just wrapped it in plastic lap really well, or you know, another alternative, and it's just night and day. We, so. we try in a hotel pan, cover it, leave it overnight, and we did the same thing with the same peel. We will make sure it was exactly really a fair test. And we got some flavor, it was good, but it has nothing compared to the, uh, the product because you had to push more water and, mm -hmm. and the flavor escape. You know, it's, it's almost like when we cook sous vide, you know, you work to a kitchen and you say, oh, look at that, it smells great, you know, you're, you love to smell flavor, but it's all the volatiles who is going away. And when you cook sous vide, that's, I remember the first time I went to French Laundry with my bags of chicken and said, Thomas, we want to work with you. And he was asking me, 
where do you buy those chicken? I'm like, it's just regular chicken. He's like, no, 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 he's Amish. He's, I said, Thomas, it's just regular chicken. And it was a concentration of all the flavor because everything is sealed. So it's a concentration, concentration, the chicken cook in their own juice, the flavor cook in their own juice, and nothing escape. No volatile escape. It's always great to smell a good kitchen, but you're losing a lot of flavor this way. Yeah, we really fix the flavor in this process. And another thing to keep in mind, too, is you know, the, the liquid that's left over, it's completely like delicious just on its own. You don't have to cryoconcentrate it right away, but when you do, it just really enhances it. It brightens it up. We're not adding heat after that. If we did add heat after that, it would taste completely different. It would be like a boiled stock or a broth. This is just totally pure. Another advantage, I'm seeing the sign over there like that. <laughs> Another advantage, we, um, we cook at lower temperature, so we have more vitamin and more vinerol. You know, higher the temperature, more we're going to destroy. One more question. Yes. Well, chef life, what we do is uh, we freeze it. You know, you do your cryo concentration in the summer, you have tons of carrot or whatever. You do your cryo one, two, three. Usually you want to go lower, so like that doesn't take so much space in your freezer. And then you just keep it. And uh, depending how good is your freezer, if you vacuum pack it, you know, we keep it for a year. Yeah, in my experience, the extract versus starting with juice has a much longer shelf life over a year frozen because you don't run the risk of it separating. It's a cooked product. You, but it you, doesn't taste cooked. You don't want to keep it in the Ziploc. Uh, just use a good quality of uh, bags. So you have to be very impermeable to air. So, uh, you know, there is no, if you have a good freezer, there is no limit of shelf life almost. All right, so I think uh, we have our next uh, presenter who is ready to, uh, to come. Yeah, if anyone's interested in learning about more, we'll be here for the rest of the day. And we have a yes. couple trainings coming up at the and end we'll of And we'll be at the party tonight. May. You can stop us and ask more yeah. questions. Thank you very much. Oh, one more thing. Uh, we publish a sous vide magazine. Uh, this issue is number six. You can find it at uh, Bar and Noble, Whole Food. It's really for the start. Uh, you can come look at it. I don't have too many. But it's really, um, like we are saying, a lot of people are cooking at home. And there is a lot of misinformation on the net. So we decide to, uh, to do a magazine. Keeping simple, we don't want to make it too complicated, otherwise people will not do sous vide. But you can come look. This one is Dominique Crane. We did a picture a year ago before she was three stars. We wanted to have a strong chef uh, woman in our magazine, and uh, she's doing a lot of things sous vide. So thank you very much. Hey, thank you so much. Let's hear it for him. Now, sometimes I listen to people who are really smart, and I just feel like, Damn, I'm stupid. <laughs> uh, but sometimes you listen to people who are really smart, and at the end of it, you feel a little bit smarter. That's how I feel right now. And I'm really excited to hear from somebody else who um, I'm, I'm absolutely excited to hear from. Uh, you hear sometimes that the, the best science is sometimes a little bit of an art, and the best art sometimes has a science to it. And if there's a man who I think has really embodied that principle of taking science to the level of art and art to the level of science, it is our next speaker, Francisco Magoya. Could you please put your hands together for Francisco Magoya? Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, we're just getting new fresh batteries in the clicker, and uh, we'll get going. Uh, but what I'm going to try to do the next 30, 35 minutes or so is basically distill four and a half years of my life into the, the next 35 minutes, uh, because that's how long this book took to write. Uh, so I'm just going to share with you some of what we do, and then some of the highlights from our book, um, and uh, just try to take a, a quick deep dive into uh, what this project entail. That's my lab. Uh, I say my lab, but of course I don't own it. Uh, but I, this is where I work. Uh, this picture is actually not very up to date. We've started working on our new project, which is a book on pizza, modernist pizza. Uh, still a couple years out. So we have we've have new ovens in here. We have pizza ovens, and we have more specialized equipment to work towards this project. This is what our lab looked like when we were in the deep of working uh, in our, on our bread book. 
That's the team. In the middle is the founder and visionary of Modern Cuisine. He's Nathan Mervold. He's my boss. And then this is my team of uh, chefs, including myself, uh, who do all the work in the, in the kitchen to develop the recipes, techniques, and experiments that, that we execute for the book. Uh, we have, uh, these are our books, some of you, I mean, here, a lot of people might be familiarized with these books, but these are the first books we published. To the left uh, was the Modernist Cuisine book. I wasn't part of the team yet when this book was written. Um, and then there's the at-home version of it, and then the photography of this book. Uh, this is our, uh, this year, we have uh, foreign editions coming out of our book in French, German, and Spanish, which is very exciting. For me, personally, to be able to have this book in Spanish is, is very important, so. And it's a quick video. That should start there. pounds of ink for each book. It's not, the, it's not the first thing you think about when you think about a book is how much does the ink in it weigh. That's how much it weighs uh, in our book. So that's a brief introduction. I really like that video because it really speaks to what, it, what this project is. And it's, it's, it's very exciting to me. To Every time I, I hear it, it, it gets me pumped for some reason. But um, who are these books for? It's typically, we have about three different kinds of people that uh, we, we are thinking of when we write these books. Uh, people who are passionate and curious about food, obviously. Home cooks and bakers, professional chefs and bakers, and industry professionals. Uh, this is some of the, some of the facts from, from our book. Uh, it's five volumes. It weighs about what, a, what a, a, a flour sack weighs, which I found pretty interesting, 53 pounds. 2,642 pages, 1,500 experiments, uh, 1,200 recipes, five research chefs, about 6,000 photos, 200 contributors, about a million words, 40, 40 tons of flour, about 60,000 loaves of bread baked uh, just for our, our recipe development and for experiment development. So this is one of my favorite pictures. For some reason, it's skipping over it. Um, it's one of my favorite pictures because this is a picture that took a long time to take. Not the picture in and of itself, but the, the breads that are in this picture. These are all historical recipes. Uh, what we did is we went really far back into the past uh, to Roman times where we, we found our first recipes for bread. Uh, Pliny the Elder had, uh, he wrote like everything that was known during Roman times. He wrote basically an encyclopedia of everything that was known at the time including a bread recipe. So we baked that bread. We baked a bunch from the, uh, up until the Renaissance. Uh, it was very complicated because we had to find, you know, the recipes weren't always written with exact quantities. And if they did write the quantities, it were units of measure that don't exist anymore. So it was very challenging in that regard. We had some recipes that would say, you know, add enough water. I mean, me as a pastry chef, that drives me bonkers. I don't, I don't add enough water to what? Um, and so it was, it, was, it was kind of like a labor of love to get these, these breads made. Um, and the reason why we did it is because there is this nostalgia that the best bread is in the past, that you know, we need to go back to how bread used to be made. Uh, we wanted to find out if that was actually the case. Um, and I will tell you that after having made these breads and after having tasted these breads, the best bread is not in the past by any extent of the imagination. Uh, there are 
a few things about bread that we did learn that's very interesting. Breads that we thought that had been around for a very long period of time haven't even been around for even 100 years, like panettone, baguette. It's not even 100 years old. Baguette is such a ubiquitous bread. Uh, but it, it's, it, it, you weren't able to make a good baguette with flour from the past. You had to have more uh, higher tech mills and more refining of the flour to be able to make a baguette. Um, this one was really interesting, which is ciabatta. Often when we think of, of Italian breads, and sometimes you know, if, we, if we reference ciabatta, the thought is that ciabatta is this really old bread that's been around for a long period of time. In reality, ciabatta was created in 1982, and it has a very specific date, because a man who developed ciabatta, he actually patented the method for making ciabatta. So if you've ever made ciabatta, you might be in for a lawsuit, because it is patented. Um, but it was, it's, it's a bread that is, when I was born, didn't exist. Um, so it's a, it's a rather new, new bread. Some of the things we discovered about bread. So I'm going to go into each and every one of these with extreme detail, so hopefully you're... Um, no, it was just, you know, you work four and a half years on a project, you learn a lot of things. To me, it was very interesting to understand that something that only has four ingredients, there's so many things that we still don't know about it and so many things that we did learn about it. Uh, for, a bread that, for an ingredient that seems so simple as bread, there was still yet a lot to be found out. Uh, one of the things that we came across is, you know, people have a difficulty working with certain breads, um, meaning there's breads that are very low in hydration, so they're very tight. And typically what you see happen in large industrial manufacturing is that they use dough relaxers. Um, and these could be any kind of dough relaxers like L-cysteine. There's, uh, there's, there's various enzymes that are concentrated to, to act as dough relaxers. But it turns out that there's many other ways to do this. Uh, for example, I don't know if you've ever made challah. Challah is a very low hydration bread. It's very tight. Some people find it very hard to roll it out and keep it rolled out. Uh, and it's, it could be a challenge to shape challah. Um, the enzymes that we utilize and that are utilized industrially for, uh, for relaxing dough, basically what they do is they cut certain molecules. But the solution that we found for this is a very simple one. A lot of people are afraid of chemicals, where in reality chemicals are everywhere, but you know, bear with me. Uh, there are ingredients that you can find in a grocery store that you can add to a dough that will act as a dough relaxer. If you have kiwi, pineapple, uh, papaya, they all contain an enzyme that basically what it does is it cuts those gluten strands and it makes them more, the dough easier to handle. And I'm talking literally two or three drops of pineapple juice are enough to relax one kilo of dough. Um, and it just, it makes dough handling extremely easy. Uh, this was something that was unexpected. Um, when we were working on our uh, recipes for gluten-free breads, you know, one of the things that we like about bread is that it's elastic and that elasticity comes from gluten. But there's people that prefer to eat gluten-free breads or celiac and so they can't eat gluten. So how do you replicate that stretchiness? That seems to be the holy grail of gluten-free breads, is how, how do you get to that stretchiness? And so if you've ever warmed up a tortilla and then you try to you know, tug on it, it does have a little bit of stretch. But it's made out of corn, and the corn does not contain any gluten. So how did it become stretchy? Initially, we thought it was nixtamalization. And nixtamalization is basically a process of combining the, the corn with lime. And lime is, is basically what it does, is it breaks down the outer shell of, of the corn so it makes it digestible, otherwise you can't digest it. Um, once the corn is boiled with the lime, the lime is rinsed, um, it's cooled down and dried out and pulverized and that's how you get tortilla flour. So what we decided to do is um, Try it with other ingredients. So nixtamalization can be done with pretty much any grain. And so we tried it with rye grains, with sorghum, um, the same process in which you get the flavor of, you know, basically nixtamalization, but also the grain as well. 
And so we made rye tortillas, we made sorghum tortillas, we made like all, a whole bunch of tortillas. They were all nice and stretchy. And so we thought, well, we could probably apply this nixtamalization with grains so that we can add that to gluten-free breads to add to elasticity. Uh, and we did, and what we got was this gluten-free bagel. And we, we have our gluten-free flour mix in which we added masa harina to it. And it did have, it was a lot stretchier. It felt almost like a regular bagel. But the thing is that it tasted like a taco. It's like a taco bagel. And so that's fine if that's what you're going for. If you want a taco bagel, it's perfect. So one of the things that we sort of missed was the fact that when you nixtamalize a grain, you're pre-cooking it. The lime is almost incidental in the process. So it turns out that if you pre-gelatinize, meaning you pre-cook a portion of your grains that you're adding into your gluten-free flour mix, it's going to become elastic. That pre-gelatinization helps uh, starches become more elastic in the second time that they're cooked. Uh, and so that's how we developed our gluten-free bagel, which I think is, is pretty darn fantastic. I mean, you're not, it's not going to fool everybody, but some people who tasted it didn't know that it was a gluten-free bagel. So we got pretty close to that. Uh, to piggyback on bagels, um, I mean, I love bagels. I used to live in New York for a long period of time. Um, and one of the biggest issues with bagels is that half of the toppings either end up in your toaster or they end up in the bag that you get your bagel in. They don't really attach to it. So we decided to tackle this problem. It did seem like something that was worth uh, pursuing, especially if you've ever had like an everything bagel that has like onions and garlic. That always burns. They always burn, and you get this acrid burnt taste from the, uh, from the burnt uh, onion and, and garlic. So we thought of a different way of doing this. And so it, what it basically entailed was to boil and bake the bagels with nothing on them. And then we created a slurry uh, basically with modified tapioca starch. The commercial name is Ultratex 3. So it's basically like a very thick liquid that we bathe the bagel in. And then we coat it with the toppings and it goes in the oven for five minutes just to evaporate the moisture from the slurry. So what you have is this slurry is just basically making all of these toppings cling to the bagel and they really stay on. I say maybe you lose about five to seven percent of the toppings. It's not like they all stay on, but it's a much lesser loss of toppings to the bagel. So, and it makes for a better experience, I think, because we can coat the bagel completely top and bottom with, it, with whatever toppings that we're putting on it. So it makes for, if you slice a bagel in half, you get the top with the toppings and the bottom with nothing. In this case, you can have toppings all over the bagel. So these are them. Uh, we also developed a method for baking bread in a jar. This is a, one of those things that if initially somebody would have explained this to me, it would have seemed like a very, an extremely dangerous proposition. Because you're basically, you're baking a glass jar under pressure in an oven. Um, and we tested this because we had heard about this Italian guy that was baking panettones in a jar. And it just seemed like a cool thing to try out. I read about it on his website, and I, I'm not, I don't speak Italian, so I, I misunderstood what he was saying, in which I thought that he was baking them with a lid on, in an oven. So I thought, okay, if he did it and he's still alive, then it means it works. So I, I tried it out. It was really uh, terrifying, and I asked everybody in the kitchen, kitchen to get out of the kitchen because when you have things under pressure and in glass, really bad things can happen. Uh, so they... But I, I baked the panettones in the jar. They came out of the jar on another exciting moment because the temperature differential sometimes can make the glass kind of crack and explode. It cooled off. Uh, the next day I came in and, and it had created a vacuum within the jar. So basically what it did is like it, it cooked, but it also created a tight seal because as it cooled down, it created that vacuum. Uh, weeks later, I communicated with the, the guy who invented this to give him credit in our book. And he said, no, that's not how I do it. He says, I never put the lid on. That's crazy. Why would you do that? So I'm glad I misunderstood, because if I had not misunderstood, we wouldn't have developed this technique, which actually works pretty great. It works great for preserving bread. When you bake bread this way, it's in a vacuum. It will take many months to stale. Staling is basically water leaching from starches in bread, and that's why it becomes crumbly. It's not, it doesn't become, it's not chewy anymore. 
But once you're in a vacuum, what you have is the water can't move anywhere. Everything is static, so you can preserve bread for many, many months. In fact, we have bread in a jar that we baked two years ago in our lab, and it's still perfectly fine. It's not very cost efficient, because in this case, what you have is the jar is more expensive than its contents. But it's a good thing to give away. It's a good uh, way to, if you make your own bread at home, to preserve it if you make a big batch. Um, so it's a, it's a really interesting technique. And uh, I, I developed a dessert, uh, a rum baba, which is one of my favorite desserts, in a jar. And it's spectacular because the rum just kind of ages beautifully with the bread, and it becomes a, a delicious dessert. Um, and very aromatic because all the aromas are concentrated in a jar. Oh, this was, this was a fantastic discovery. I mean, how many times have you made bread and it overproofs and you just throw it away, disappointed? If you're not a baker, you're probably like, I'm never making bread again. Uh, it's just that investment of time that's gone down the trash can. Um, and it's, it's, it takes you many months before you gather up the, the courage to make bread again because you don't want to fail again. Uh, but we thought, you know, let's intentionally overproof bread and see if we can fix it or do anything with it. Uh, to not discard it, because we, we're big proponents of not wasting things. Uh, bread has become this thing that, because it's so cheap, it's like a disposable food. Uh, it's something that, if it's two or three days old, we just get rid of it and buy more. Uh, it, it's, it, it, we want to make sure that people can be as, as um, efficient and, and less wasteful as possible, including with, with bread. So what we did is we took just, this, just a basically French lean bread, um, we overproofed it. It, was, it basically expanded and it collapsed. That expansion occurs because the bubbles inside the dough expand. The bubble walls basically become too thin, and so they can't support the weight anymore, and it collapses. So it's like tiny little balloons inside your dough that are too weak to withstand that expansion. Um, that expansion, what is in there is CO2 and ethanol. And so we took the dough out, over-fermented, we reshaped it, and we let it see if it was going to proof again. And by God, it proofed again. It proofed again. It took more or less the same amount of time to proof. Um, and we baked it, and it, the bread was, it was a little bit tighter because it was stronger from having reshaped it. Uh, but we were able to bake it again. And so then we decided to push our luck. How many times can we overproof bread, or dough rather, before it's not good anymore? This was 10 times overproofed. So this is really just to prove a point. Because if you overproof bread or dough 10 times, you should probably not be a baker. Or you should get a timer. Because I don't know what to tell you after 10 times. We stopped at 10 because the dough started to get really tight. I mean, it was, at this point, it was like, it was like a rubber band. Uh, but as you can see, the color is still there. It still has this beautiful ear down the middle. Um, it, it was still a good uh, loaf of bread to eat. So next time that happens, just reshape your, bread, your dough, put it in a basket, and let it go again uh, to ferment as long as it needs to to get back into shape. Uh, another uh, interesting technique is uh, we call complete wheat. I understand that that is misspelled, but we did it on purpose. It's a cheeky way because it rhymes with wheat. Um, if we look at a, a wheat kernel, the, the majority of a wheat kernel is endosperm, which is the white powdery stuff that's in the middle. And then you have bran and you have germ. And when you grind these things together, what you get is whole wheat flour. The challenge with whole wheat flour is that it's very difficult to make very good bread with whole wheat flour. Typically, you get very dense breads. Um, the reason for this is because the bran and the germ, they do two things. They love water, so they steal water from the rest of the dough. And the other thing that they do is they get in the way of gluten development. So they're volume killers and they're water hoarders. Uh, the problem is that whole wheat bread actually tastes pretty good. Uh, so how do you get a, wheat, a whole wheat bread that's going to taste good, but you're going to have that nice open crumb, that volume that you're looking for with these like, artisan breads? So what we did is we, we thought about mathematically, you know, what is the proportion of bran and germ? So bran is about 14% of the kernel. Germ is about 2.5% of the weight, and the endosperm is the rest of the weight of the grain. So here you can see the scale of you know, incrementing 10% incrementing whole wheat flour to a bread, how it became this really compact, lowest volume loaf of bread when it was 100% whole wheat flour. 
On the right side, what we did is, is the technique that we developed for complete wheat in which we said, okay, we have this much flour. We're going to mix the dough. This is white flour. We're going to mix the dough till it has some uh, strength, so like medium gluten development more or less. And then what we're going to do is we're going to add the bran and the germ. So it's kind of a reverse engineering of what whole wheat flour is. Uh, we took the bran and the germ. We toasted it first to deactivate the enzymes that kind of get in the way of gluten development. But we also, by toasting it, we made it more aromatic. It's, it's got a more of a stronger nutty aroma than if you just bake it in, in your loaf of bread. And eventually, uh, we came across another idea, which was to take this toasted bran and germ and soak it in a little bit of water so that it wouldn't steal water from the rest of the dough. So with this, what we were able to do is we were, gonna, we were able to have 100% whole wheat sourdough with all of the bran and germ, very aromatic, and with a lot more volume than if it was 100% pure milled whole wheat flour. Uh, it takes a little bit more of work, but it created a really nice loaf of bread. Uh, impromptu sourdough or Senker Chan sourdough. Uh, how many times have you started a, a sourdough uh, pre-ferment and you feed it, you feed it, you feed it, and then there's days where you just can't make bread, and what do you do after with whatever you have to discard? So what we learned is that if you take that amount that you would have discarded instead of making bread, uh, you take it, you freeze it, you put it in a Ziploc bag. It won't be very active with the yeast anymore, but it still has two very important things. One is that it still has the flavor of a sourdough starter, and the second is that you already have hydrated flour. Hydrated flour means flour that has already absorbed water. The benefit of that is that you're going to have a much, a greatly reduced mix of your dough once you have that hydrated flour in there. So what do you do for fermentation? You just add commercial yeast. We add a, per, a percentage, 0.5% of commercial yeast. We use this frozen leftover or discarded sourdough starter. And you get a beautiful loaf of bread that, that smells, tastes, and looks like a sourdough bread. But it was just fermented with a little bit of commercial yeast. By the way, commercial yeast is not the enemy. A lot of people are like, oh, you use commercial yeast, you're not a real baker. It's the same strain of yeast. I mean, there's, it's not like one is poisonous and one is better than the other. One is just stronger than the other. So we're, we're, we're utilizing two different uh, concepts here of, of baking bread to make, uh, to be less wasteful and to be able to utilize uh, all of our, our pre-ferment starter, sourdough starter. And with this, we have uh, uh, just our book is uh, going to be coming out in a couple of years. We're talking uh, modernist pizza. It's not going to be as big of a, of a undertaking, but we're still looking at about two or three volumes about pizza. Um, and, you know, in a nutshell, this is, these, this is some of the, the bigger, larger, more practical discoveries that we made in the book. But, you know, if, if I had more time, I could talk to you more about what these 2,642 pages are about. But hopefully this is something that inspires you to make some bread, to not throw that overproof bread away, to make better bagels, which, by the way, that whole New York City water thing with the bagels, we made it a point to try to disprove that. And it turns out that you can make pretty good bagels anywhere in the world. It has nothing to do with the water. Uh, we can talk about it later, but I talked about this a couple of weeks ago in New York City. It was very brave of me to do that, but it was, uh, some people took issue with it, but you know, the, the thing is that science doesn't care about your feelings. Um, and, and if you can prove a point, there's, it's basically you can't argue against it. So um, we did a lot of testing with New York City water and Seattle water, and we did blind tastings. We put our doughs through different, um, machines, a texture analyzer, uh, an extensor graph, and so forth. And basically, as long as you, you follow s a sound technique and a sound method, you're going to get a great bagel no matter where you live. So anyway, so that's, that's uh, some of what modern spread is. And uh, I'm not going to take any questions, unfortunately, because there's no time. But uh, thank you very much for coming, and uh, thanks for your time. Hey, let's hear it again for Francisco. Come on, come on. Like, this is the last panel of the day. You don't know this is the end. You don't get any more content. Sorry. But uh, you do get some more food. 
Uh, you're going to get some drinks. Uh, that's all coming up right now. One thing I do want to mention, um, we have some bread. It was here this morning from Prager Brothers, a local bakery. I know they're inspired by the work Francisco's been doing. We've just been preparing a few small bites of bread with some butter from our incredible sponsor, Butter of Europe. That's just going to be out here for you to have a little snack, you know, get some carbs in you before you hit the open bar. That's important. I recommend it. Also, drink water. <laughs> Seriously, please do that. Uh, then we've got the Pork Fest coming up. We're shooting to start that at 5 o'clock. Thank you all so much for being here. This is the first ever anti-convention. And here's the man behind it all, Franz Vanderlee. Thank you. So, you know, I think some people had to fly out um, early, so I think we're going to have plenty of food. So if you have friends in San Diego, some chef friends you want to invite, let's, let's party. <laughs> 